Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. With you as always is Bob, live in the natural lounge, staring at the Ouija board. Huh? So I'm back out here in the woods because it rained for five days straight and the sun came out today. And I was like, dude, I'm going to the woods, you know, I'm going back to the woods. I had read that, um, you know, connecting with nature is good for you. Duh. You know what I mean? Hello. You know what's not good for you? Fast food, sugar, salts. Shit that we put in our body. Shit I put in my body. You know what I mean? Like, dude, I've been eating ice cream every night. <sighs> and I'm really upset with myself because I feel like I put on a little weight. But you know what? That's something that, you know, is for me and for me alone. Do you ever have somebody older or watch somebody say, hey, she looks like she put on weight. Why don't you worry about yourself, old man? Okay. You know what I mean? You don't need to chat about people's bodies, you know? I can only imagine what it's like to be in a body that you're super happy and content with right you're like oh look at me in the mirror i'm good you know we live in such a weird world where like appearances and photographs depict reality but it's really far from reality because technically your, your brain perceives light comes in through the frontal lobe and then in the back of your brain that's what's the the images are so it's like we're only experiencing a reality that we think is real but i can tell you you know, I mean, at the surface, one of the things that I think we're struggling with, and, you know, we all know this, is social media, right? I know, oh, someone's like, I'm turning this podcast off, but hear me out. I took off from Facebook for about three months. June, July, yeah, June, July, August, four months. June, July, August, September about, right? I'm not on Facebook. I'm not on the platform at all. Um, on Reddit and Instagram, that's about it. And um, it was nice being away from Facebook. And then I logged back in, right, after taking a little sabbatical. And I forgot about the terror that lurks in those blue pages, you know? Like, people live their lives out on there. And you know what? When I look back at the Facebook memories, I also lived out my life there. But that was also when I was trying to be the man, dude, you know? I was like, I got to be the man. I got to be... The only podcast in town. I've got to be the biggest band in town. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. Why was I doing all that? Because I wanted attention. I didn't really get attention when I was growing up. So, you know what I mean? I wanted to prove to somebody, hey, Rob Cahill over there is uh, talented. So, it led me down many paths. Many paths of creativity, but also many paths of self-destruction. And the thing we're going to talk about today is something that's popped back in my, my head. I think I talked about this way back on like the Bobcast episode 7, 2014. But this is a real experience that happened to me, and I'm going to share it with you all. And we can reflect on it together, all right? So here's the deal. When my music career started to come to an end and Downtown Harvest started breaking up, I was interested, interested in pursuing another career, right? So, hey, Dylan. So in a nutshell, it's like... What I've always been passionate about music and movies, so I was like, all right, dude, I'm going to fulfill a dream of mine, and this dream is to become a screenplay writer, okay? At the age of 30, I was like, all right, dude, here we go. Start a new career, and where do I go to start a new career? Monco. I go to MCC3. I don't even know how many C's there are in that thing, but hey, I went there. I had a good time, and my teacher happened to be the current mayor of uh, Country Hawking, Yaniv Aronson, and... um I picked it up pretty quick. I wrote a spec script, they call it, a comedy script called Lookout Lou. The Lookout Lou script won the 2012 um, Grand Prize for the Philadelphia Screenplay Festival. I was uh, flown to Burbank. I think I got the plane ticket for free. I, I think I won that, but I had to pay for my hotel. But it was um, to go to something called... A virtual pitch fest and what's a virtual pitch fest based or no it wasn't even virtual it was an actual pitch fest it was before well, long before covid and basically they flew you out there because they thought your script was good and you go up into this like uh, hilton up in burbank burbank is where they you know lots of studios are there's an airport other than that there ain't shit and uh you know we go to this pitch meeting and i start going through all these pitches right and it's brutal, okay? Like, I thought I had Philadelphia Charm. Didn't really work there. I was not really well-received. The script, by the way, Look Out Lou, is about an agoraphobic man that falls in love with a out-of-town tourist. 
and uh, him making the sacrifice of getting over his fears and anxieties to be with the woman he loves. Uh, I don't know if I really pitched it like that because that sounded a lot better right there than what I did. But I do recall this one lady who was working for a prominent film company just tearing me down, dude. Like, I don't get it. I'm done here. Like, I can't remember what she said, but I remember the feeling of just crushing defeat. And so, like, nothing really came from the pitch fest. I was kind of bummed, you know. I'd, I'd um, worked on this for a long time with my brother Sam, and, like, we were excited that, you know, I'd flown out there, and I thought for sure there'd be something. I got some contacts, but nothing really nothing really popped off. And then this, this script we put aside for a moment, and we started writing something else. And then at that time, my brother Sam, who I would write with, got a job. He's a, an editor, video editor. He gets a job working for this up-and-coming YouTube show called That's a Domino. Right off the bat, that's a shitty title, okay? Um, yeah, man. So, like, he starts to film this show, and the show is, like, basically... If you know the comedian Andrew Schultz, where, like, during COVID, he would go over current events, and they would talk about it. It's just basically like a talk show, you know, like a morning show type thing. But it, it had two hosts. And the two hosts, I can't say their names because I'm telling you the story. And I think I signed an NDA, but I mean, whatever. You know, hey. But the, the one guy has been in several films. He was in one film, I can tell you, called ATL Atlanta years ago. And then the other son, how do I say? I guess, I, yeah, I can't say his name, but I can say that he is somehow related to P. Diddy. Did he steps on? Nobody told you that. Nobody said it. Okay. But when I found it out, I was like, oh my God, my brother's working for, I think he was called Puff Daddy or Puff. I can't remember. But, you know, I was, I was excited for my brother, you know? And then, you know, he's, he's working on the project. A couple episodes come out on YouTube. They're funny, you know? And word gets back to me that they want to see if Sam and his brother can write a script for a TV show based on the characters from That's a Domino. They wanted to call the TV show That's a Domino. And basically the premise that I came up with was, I mean, at the time, Entourage was coming to an end, you know, and I thought it'd be interesting to tell, like, I always, like, liked um, movies like Menace to Society, New Jersey Drive, um, Juice, you know what I mean? Like, I liked, uh, I liked that, those stories. I felt strangely connected to it, being a white man or whatever, but I, 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 I understood their struggle in a way that I could write about. And when I wrote That's a Domino, I remember they, them thinking I was black. I wasn't black, but they were excited to meet me and they flew me out there, right? I write this script and basically the premise of the script was uh, black actors early in Hollywood trying to get roles that were written for black people, but they were all going to white actors. It's kind of what happened a couple of years later, but I had written a whole sitcom show about that um whitewashing and like it was almost like the black entourage you know what i mean and the main character it starts off with him in a major um producer's office and he's like you know come on this role's perfect for me he's like sorry man but this is going to you know so and so who happens to be one of the number one box office draws but like you know the main character is arguing with the producer this guy ain't even black you know you're changing the role for this guy and basically things fall apart. But then like, you know, the script was like basically the rise of this, this actor. And I told him my goal was to mix Entourage with the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. And if you recall, everybody loved Will Smith. Everybody loved Vinny Chase from Entourage. And I wanted the main characters to be loved, right? So they fly me out there. And I'm like, this is it. I'm on my way. Look at me. Creativity. Oh, my ego's popping off at the seams. I'm on a trip to Vegas. I get on the plane. I get into a fight with Jerry Lewis. No joke. I asked him to say a couple words to my grandma because she was a big fan and tried to take a video of him. And he pushed me out of the way. And I insulted him and told him that his slippers were real nice. And he said they should be. They're expensive. And I was like, I get it. You're Jerry Lewis. And then the security got pissy. Eh, long story. But then I get to L.A., right? And I should be super excited. But something about when I land, I... You know, you ever just step off into a new territory or new place that you haven't been in a while and you're like, you know what? I shouldn't be here right now. You know, I shouldn't be here doing this. What's happening? So I get out into the lot where the cars come to pick you up and the producer, one of the producers of the show, the money man, I should say, comes to pick me up. And when he picks me up, the first thing I recognize is that he's got a BMW, but it's got a cracked windshield, which is pretty explanatory of his 
character and his demeanor cracked. So meanwhile, my brother lives in LA and this guy picks me up and I'm like, all right, great. You're going to take me to my brother's house now, right? He's like, nah, I got to show you something. I got to show you something, yo. I'm like, all right, whatever. So then he takes me to the opposite side of Hollywood, to West Hollywood, and he takes me to this like mansion in the hills. This mansion was a piece of shit mansion. I'm telling you this right now. And it was used for like music videos and like shoots. You know what I mean? Like I wasn't impressed. I'm like, wait, why are we here? You know what I mean? To look, I lived in LA. I don't need to look over at the city. I want to get to work on this thing, you know, bad vibes right off the bat because he's just talking about himself. He's just talking about this, that, whatever. He's got a really weird vibe, but I'm just, I'm not into it one bit, you know? So he drops me off from my brothers. I tell my brother about the weird meeting with this guy we started calling him cookie so i'm gonna call him cookie for the rest of the story i don't know how he got the name cookie but he's cookie so the next day arises and we're told that we're supposed to go to where they the hotel next to where they filmed the oscars on hollywood and highland and you know we're, we're told that we're going into a top 40 rappers hotel room to record the podcast and i'm like say what say this again i'm uh, Okay, so we go in this guy's room whose song had broken into the top 40. Can't say his name. Dude's miserable, okay? He, he's mad that he's not getting paid for it. And I'm just like, did I even write this guy in the show? Like, what are we doing in this room? It's like, oh, we're going to have the table read here. Yo, it's going to be good. I'm like, there's no table. It's just a bed. You know what I mean? So then uh, hours go by. My brother and I were like, fuck this. We're walking down the in and out. We're getting a burger. We go, we get a burger. It's pretty sweet. And then I think like uh, two, three hours pass and we get a text or a phone call that says, you know, uh, we're going to skip this table read and we're going to pick up later tonight around like nine o'clock or so. And I'm like, all right, yeah, okay, great. You know, we wasted a whole day already, you know, not a good sign. Second good sign, right? So then we get to 9 p.m. God, dude, I'm exhausted. I'm jet lagged. You know what I mean? Like I'm still on my time philly time not la time so you know it feels like midnight i'm barely there and they all arrive 38 40 minutes late something like that and we start to table read man it's funny dude i'm like finally here we are things are really popping off you know i could hear the characters in their voices i could feel like the scenes like working and uh, we wrap up they roll blunt and we go outside we're standing by a campfire and we start to have some fun joking, laughing and stuff like that. And we wrap up for the night. We say we're going to, you know, meet tomorrow again. And like, you know, come up with like a beat sheet, which would prep, which is like kind of like, you know, all the things that are going to happen during the season. It's actually called a Bible, but. And um, so I'm like, cool. So my brother and I are triumphant. We go out. We have a good time in West Hollywood. And then we go to bed, wake up. I got an email from Cookie couple notes on the script he'd been up all night while we were out partying triumphant that the script worked and it was a good table read and there's some changes for us to make now look as a screenplay writer you got to know a couple of things one writing is rewriting okay you got to rewrite drafts because your first draft most of the time sucks i heard sylvester sloan wrote rocky in three days it's insane i don't know how he did it but it takes about a year really to write a script that's like 90 to 110 120 pages right so you got to rewrite stuff right but the rewrite's got to make sense. Now, if you recall, I told you that I want to mix Entourage with Will Smith. This is Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. I love the character, right? I want to love this dude. Like, invite this guy to Thanksgiving dinner, you know? The first change, they say, we want him leaving the producer's office. And when he leaves the producer's office, he's going to go down Sunset Boulevard, meet two girls. They go into a piece of pizza, and they have a threesome in the bathroom. Did you get my pitch, dude, about him being a lovable guy? Now, so first off, he's going to be a misogynist right off the bat. He gets struck down by the studio, and then he uses a celebrity to have sex with women at a pizza shop. And then there was a litany of other inappropriate jokes or inappropriate things that they wanted me to write about. But like, I just I couldn't. Uh, I, I just I saw the writing on the wall. I, get, I kept thinking about the crack in the windshield. I kept thinking about, you know, them not being on time. I kept thinking about the wasted opportunity in the wonderful pilot script that we had and how they wanted to change it into something raunchy. And if you recall, 
those rated R films of the late thousands, early 2010s were raunchy. There was, you know, like a lot of films that they would never be able to make today that were rated R. And the thing that's crazy about that is they wanted to, like, this was a TV show that we were trying to pitch to HBO. You know what I mean? My, um, how you doing, man? All right. Good looking, though. So basically, I mean, like, you know, my agent was happy. We had an agent, too, at this time, so it was legit. They were not going to get away with just, like, taking our script from us, you know? There's so many, my agent's telling me, like, well, you should just make the changes, or if you, you know? And, like, I was just like, dude, I don't want to make these changes. I don't want to make these changes because I don't want my first thing to be seen that is I'm not proud of, you know? It's like making a piece of art and then throwing peanut butter all over it. Though that does sound abstract and fun, it ain't what I'm trying to get my point across or, or my creativity. I want it to be seen for something that I was proud of, not for something that was embarrassing, you know? And I think the exploitation of women, I think the exploitation of sexuality, it's just a mistake in entertainment, you know? We all have sex, you know what I mean? We don't need to, like, say it in a gratuitous manner. It messes with your brain, you know? And I just didn't want to write that shit. And I didn't like the fact he took me to that mansion and I couldn't go see my brother for hours. He kept me from him, you know? It's like, dude, we're the writing team. Take me to the team. Let's work. So, you know, they say we're going to meet on the fourth day. And I'm like, dude, I, there is no fourth day. I, got, I told you I was here for three days. I got to get back to my job. This is going to be Monday, right? Um, did I have to get back to my job? Not really. So then, like, he comes over to have a meeting with us, right? And I was like, dude, I was like, we can have this meeting in the car. You can drive me to the airport. I'm going to be late for my plane. I was just about to get a taxi. Uber wasn't out at the time. So, like um he he's like cool i'll drive you so he, he's telling me the whole way from like uh east la silver lake glendale area all the way to lax about the changes of the script and what he wants this that or whatever you know and I, I we get to we get to the airport dude and i don't know what possessed me to do this but like i got out of the car i went over to his side i was like roll down the window shook his hand i said hey man Appreciate you driving me to the airport, and I appreciate this opportunity, but this is as far as you and I go as working together. And he looked at me like he was shocked. This kid's going to quit, you know? Like, this is the biggest opportunity of his lifetime. I can't remember what I said to him, but I remember saying something to the effect, this trip has been nothing but unprofessional. You guys should try to take yourselves a little bit more serious. Give me a call in a couple of years if, you know, you ever come around to it, but I'm not writing trash like that. And I turned my back to him, and I got on the plane ticket that they paid for me, which was first class. And uh, I rolled home. I rolled home. And I was like, you know what? I felt iffy about the whole thing. You know, I was just like, I don't know about this, man. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't know how I feel about this. It feels, feels off. You know what I mean? Like, did I do the right thing? You know, did I squander my only opportunity? And you know what? Years passed by. And, you know, I... I I still write, you know, but like the urge for me to seek attention is over. And I don't know how it happened. I mean, probably COVID, to be honest with you, because I really got a chance to look inward. And when you look inward, dude, you know what I mean? And all you see is shit about yourself you don't like. You spent a whole lifetime just trying to be the man or be successful. You didn't really live a good life. You lived a life of like ego and greed you know what i mean like ego and greed i'm sorry we're down here at bell's mills you know the drill any chance i die here recording this podcast of a troubled tr trouble uh with you know people in their cars driving home after work they're so angry that they can't wait to drive home so they'll just step on the gas any chance they get and put li people's lives in jeopardy it's okay i know this is ben's favorite part of the podcast so shout out to you ben um back to what i was saying about everything yeah, man, I felt pretty good about myself because I was like, you know what? I don't need this guy. I don't need to be up in this guy's world. I don't need to be writing stuff that I don't believe in. I was only like 30, you know? There was other opportunities that came down the pipeline. We won a couple other competitions. We had one script get uh, optioned. Nothing really came from it, but we're still trying, you know? And having integrity for your work is something that you really can't teach or you really can't, like... Uh, can't really prepare for you know what i mean because it's like there ain't no way around that you got to believe in yourself man and that's so hard in today's world because people they don't believe in themselves no more they believe in facebook they believe in chick-fil-a apps they believe in all sorts of weird shit that's not the spiritual inward self you know 
and that's what I got into during COVID. I started to like listen to all these podcasts about like spirituality and manifestation and frequencies that we use that we don't even know about that we forgot about and the power within to be honest with you some people might think you're crazy and you know say you're granola dude i'm so over all those stereotypes so so over all the things that we do to each other to classify forget classifying these people into groups subgroups i i hate it you know and like i shouldn't say i hate but i do do dislike when people think that they're bigger and badder than others and i was guilty of that for a long time trying to be the man trying to get big guests on the podcast so i could wow everybody i recently just saw like some of the stuff i posted for when i was doing concert promotions and i was still desperate to get the likes you know like i saw the like amount and i remember like what i wrote and how many people i tagged in the in the post and i remember like you know just being so hard on myself back in those days you know be like ah nobody got the message didn't get out 11 people liked it i wasted all my time on this motion graphics poster nobody's coming to the show you know and then people would come to the show and i have no idea why they wouldn't click like or share it's just an endless cycle of insanity that cut myself off from and you know what i think i'm going to take a break again because when i was on facebook it reminded me of those times it reminded me of like you know those meetings with people that went nowhere it reminded me of trying to sell myself like a pop culture prostitute you know what i mean like It's over and I feel great about it. You know what I mean? I feel great about, I no longer have the urge to put myself out there. My wife said to me today, like we we switched completely. I don't want to go out no more. When I first met her, she was very quiet. I'm very quiet now. Like to be by myself, you know, like, and it's not the worst thing because it's like, I'm spending time with myself, my real self, you know? And like some people, I mean, I've been talking about how I miss my friends and stuff like that. You know, we don't see each other, but like, I'm in the woods, I'm talking, I'm recording a podcast, words are rituals, this is a ritual for you, for me, so we can heal together, you know what I mean? And like, if you're somebody who is an artist, and you have something that you do, maybe you play your bass, maybe you play Minecraft, maybe you play soccer, something you like, don't put yourself into that category where you think you've got to be monetarily successful in there to get attention, because I love you, God loves you. And this has been another episode of The Bobcast.